of beginning started on October 15th of 1942. At that point in time, I was drafted. Uh, my father happened to be chairman of the draft board at that time, but I was still drafted. Uh, went to Fort Belvoir, Virginia, in the combat engineers for three months. And while there, the Air Force put out bulletins that they were opening up pilot training for anyone that was interested and could qualify. It appeared to me after three months in combat engineers that the Air Force was a better selection. So I uh, passed the test that were requiring I was drafted. Uh, my father happened to be chairman of the draft board at that time, but I was still drafted. Uh, went to Fort Belvoir, Virginia in the combat engineers for three months. And while there, the Air Force put out bulletins that they were opening up pilot training for anyone that was interested and could qualify. It appeared to me after three months in combat engineers that the Air Force was a better selection. So I uh, passed the test that were required, went to pilot training, got my wings, my commission second lieutenant, and ended up in a B-26 outfit in, La in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, Barksdale Field. From there, we went overseas and joined the 394th Bomb Group, which was part of the 9th Air Force. Uh, we flew out of two different areas in England, uh, Chelmsford, England, and then right after D-Day, we went down to Bournemouth, England, flew out of there uh, in July of 40. Four, uh, a month and a half after D-Day, they moved us over to Normandy, where we flew uh, in support primarily of, of General Patton. Uh, from uh, As General Patton advanced, uh, they moved us down to Orleans, France, which was about 50 miles south of Paris. We were only there very briefly, and then they moved us north of Paris to Cambrai, France, where we spent, where we flew most of the missions. We were in Cambrai, France, uh, doing the Battle of the Bulge, and we were on alert to possibly have to leave that area if the Germans advanced to our location. Fortunately, they stopped, uh, got the Germans stopped before we had to leave, but, uh, that was uh, that was a pretty tough winter. Uh, had a lot of bad weather. A lot of days when they needed air support, couldn't provide it. But uh, after uh, after the Battle of Bulge, well, then of course things moved pretty quickly. I uh, I flew 63 missions, and then was uh, returned to the states for reassignment. Uh, went to. Uh, Ended up in Dodge City, Kansas, and spent about a month there, and then went to Chanute Field in Illinois, where the war in Europe ended, and then I had a choice of getting out or staying in, and I uh, had more than enough points from combat missions to receive my discharge. Uh, our first base in Normandy was called Airstrip 13, and this was in an apple orchard. Uh, the runway was put down by the engineers, and it was a steel matted runway, probably five to 6,000 feet in length. Uh, but we were in tents. We lived in tents in, in uh, Normandy, and the uh, same was true down Orleans. Uh, at Orleans, all the main buildings had been destroyed by bombing. Allied bombing. When we got to Cambrai, which was previously used by the German Air Force before we got there, they did have a wooden barracks. It, uh, not by our standards, it was kind of crude, but at least it had a roof over it and we had heat in it. So in Cambrai, we did uh, we did stay in a barracks. Uh, but in Normandy, it was strictly tents, and uh, uh, it, it was. Uh, now, while we were in Cambrai, uh, we did we did have to bail out one mission up on the French-Belgian border, 
and then after that we crash landed in Luxembourg and when we were in Luxembourg we got hung up there for about three or four days but we did have an opportunity to go to the front lines and uh, uh, that was an experience I always remember is going to the front lines uh, uh, and my hat has always been off to the infantry the foot soldiers because they really had a rough time they, their living conditions were horrible compared to ours and uh, it, it was just uh, and of course it was in winter time when we were up there and uh, they had just taken a small village the day before and a couple of german tanks were had been knocked out and they were still kind of smoking but uh, i uh, I always had a special place in my heart for the infantry people, artillery people that were really out there on the roof. And uh, I say that, that was, uh, I, we were lucky. We were fortunate to have the living conditions we had. Now, we lost a lot of people. Uh, we lost over, uh, with about a thousand flying personnel, we lost a little over 200 of them. Uh, on D-Day morning, our squadron lost four planes and four crews due to two mid-air collisions before they ever left England. And, uh, you know, <laughs> they never got shot at, but uh, they still lost four crews. They had two, uh, that was in the morning mission. I did not fly the morning mission, I flew the afternoon mission. The morning mission, they hit a rail center where there's troop concentration, German troop concentrations. Uh, they bombed the rail center. The afternoon mission was a uh, artillery uh, gun on uh, Cherbourg Peninsula, one of these large uh, artillery pieces that were shelling the, uh, well, I suppose they were shelling the ships out in the, out in the, off the coast of Normandy. But, uh, but we did fly two missions that day. Uh, we flew anywhere from 10,000 to 13,000 feet. Uh, if the weather was clear, of course, naturally you could see the target uh, at that altitude. Uh, the range of a B-26 was approximately 800 miles round trip. So you, 400 miles one way is about as far as you could go. Uh, the length of a mission, the maximum length would be about four hours. Uh, we bombed, uh, well, the group itself flew 271 missions and dropped almost a little over 13,000 tons of bombs. Uh, 60, 65 of the 271 missions were bridges railroad, highway bridges. Uh, in fact, our group was called Bridge Busters because I guess uh, we, do, we bombed more bridges than anything else. But we also bombed uh, airstrips, uh, ammunition dumps, fuel dumps, uh, a lot of railroad centers. Uh, normal mission consisted of 36 planes or two boxes of 18 each, and, and each box would be in a different altitude to prevent the anti-aircraft from zeroing in on, on, on any one group. Uh, if it was a maximum effort, like on D-Day and, and, uh, or a big, a big offense starting, then they would put up uh, 54 planes or three boxes. That was a maximum that our group could put up or any B-26 group put up was 54 planes, and there would only be about 10 planes left on the ground. We, bet, we bombed uh, buzz bomb sites. Uh, that was a V-1 buzz bomb that the Germans started sending over to England, primarily London. Uh, we, we bombed some of those uh, pillboxes, uh, miscellaneous uh, targets of all kinds, troop concentrations, rocket gun sites, uh, locomotive sheds, railroads of, of different types, motor pools. But bridges was the number one target. Uh, they tried to destroy the uh, 
ability of the Germans to move equipment and supplies. The targets after D-Day came from uh, Patton's headquarters. Uh, he's, he's the one that dictated what he wanted, knocked out. All day long bombing. Now the RAF, uh, English, they bombed nighttime. The oil crew was six, pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, com combination bombardier navigator, and three gunners. Uh, B-26 carried two tons of bombs, uh, anywhere from 100-pound anti-personnel bombs up to uh, four 1,000-pound bombs, which they would use on bridges and, and gun emplacements and uh, bunch bomb sites. Uh, had 11 50 caliber machine guns uh, on the B-26. If, if you were on a lead crew, then it carried a crew of seven. D-Day, we knew nothing about D-Day till the morning of D-Day. And during the night, they painted invasion stripes on the planes. Put these, uh, there were three painted white stripes around each mm -hmm. wing. Mm -hmm. And you better have them on your plane over deep, or over Normandy, because if, if, even though it was an Allied plane, if they weren't on there, you were going to get shot down. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you know, best, and we kept looking. We knew D-Day was coming, invasion was coming. And from the air, we kept looking for evidence of it. You could never see anything. But amazing that type and that size of an operation all the planning that went into it, you know, just tremendous amount of planning, and, and, and uh, I, I guess with the weather conditions and everything, in spite of all the shelling by the Navy, all the bombing by the Air Force, that there was as much, you couldn't believe there'd be that much resistance, but there's tremendous amount of resistance to the, to the guys going inshore. As long as you're over France or Holland or Belgium, the underground fed back pretty accurate information. And at briefing, they usually told us and accurately told us what to expect in the way of any aircraft fire, whether it was going to be heavy or moderate or very light. And usually the reports were very accurate. You know, we pretty well knew when we started on a mission what we were going to run into. When the German equipment you take the ME-109 fighter and uh, FW-190 and their 88-millimeter anti-aircraft, anti-tank, they used for anti-aircraft, anti-tank, anti-personnel, was during good equipment. And, you know, they had the rocket, they had the buzz bombs, unmanned uh, bomb, long before we did, and they had, they, had the few, they had a few jets long before we had, so, you know, but for a country the size of Germany taking on Russia and England and the U.S. and, and we had unlimited supply of, of equipment because, uh, you know, our plants over here could produce without worrying about being bombed. In England and Germany and those places, their uh, manufacturing plants are just being bombed daily almost. So, but overall, you know, we, we were very fortunate, uh, very lucky, very lucky. I think anybody that was over there in combat and got back in one piece uh, had uh, very fortunate mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of opportunities for a lot of things to happen.
Discover 